writing a new apology in Lake Ontario, building off of what Matt Povey and Ellen George have been working on uh, for the past few or several years, depending on who you're talking about. Um, and today I'll be talking a little bit about one of the projects that we've been working on and sharing some preliminary, preliminary results from that. Um, so first off, for those of you who are filing in, or for those of you who came, sat in for Matt's talk but totally forgot what he was talking about, um, Caribbeans are a group of native, cold adopted fishes um, that historically were um, dominating the native food webs in the Great Lakes. Um, so for example, they were the major sources of crayfish for all of the sport fish we love, like lake trout and Atlantic salmon. Um, and economically, they also comprise the major fisheries in the region, um, not only as their own products, but as also for supporting those piscivorous uh, fisheries as well. However, um, as Matt said, this was in the past, uh, it's the past tense, but because of their collapses in the uh, early to mid 1900s, due to things like overfishing, habitat degradation, and the impacts of invasive species, we lost a lot of these populations um, and even species. But because of that known ecological and societal importance from way back when, there's a lot of management of um, rehabilitation actions all across the Great Lakes, um, including here in Lake Ontario. Um, the fish community objectives are trying to uh, go back towards, or not go back towards, um, kind of rehabilitate some of those native fishes to have a, a diverse prey base for our sport fishes here in Lake Ontario. Um, but to meet those management actions, we need to figure out what we have remaining and what we can do to help that. So through these impacts, certain populations and species manage to persist. What enabled them to do that and what do we have remaining? Um, so some of the key information needs, well, before I go further, the two species that I'll be talking about are Cisco and Lake Whitefish in Lake Ontario. So as Matt was talking about, some of the key information needs include um, figuring out why certain subpopulations persisted through all of those impacts, um, and figuring out what is limiting these populations today, so we can better understand what we can do as managers and scientists to help um, rehabilitate these populations. So as part of that, um, we were looking at larval Corregonian production in Lake Ontario. These are kind of my uh, jargony objectives for those of you who are more involved in this project. But uh, just in terms of short titles, we were looking at the patterns of larval Corregonian production in Lake Ontario, what drives those patterns um, in terms of where we find no larvae versus few versus many, and also using that to under better understand um, creating early life history and ecology in Lake Ontario. So as part of that, um, there was a super collaborative, um, spatially extensive survey for larval creganines and near shore habitats this past year, as part of the 2018 Cooperative Science and Monitoring Initiative. Um, thanks to my amazing collaborators at USGS, DEC, MNRF, BFO, and Fish and Wildlife Service, um, we were able to sample a variety of both contemporary and historic spawning habitats across a wide variety of habitat gradients um, in almost all of the near shore habitats. Um, in terms of details for those methods, um, it was repeated sampling during peak larval Craigenian abundance um, within each habitat, um, repeated sampling with horizontal ichthyoplankton toes. And then we also have water samples for total phosphorus. Um, those aren't um, processed yet, so uh, more to come on that. <coughs> and then in lab, we sorted those samples, counted and identified the larvae, subsampled for zooplankton. And then one thing that is important to note is that um, we still are in the process of identifying these creganines to the species level using genetic barcoding. Um, one of the problems with larval creganines is that it's almost, uh, it's pretty inaccurate to try and distinguish between cisco and lake whitefish as their larvae because they are really plastic in their morphology. 
So for example, Ellen George developed a genetic barcoding technique using the CO1 gene that we're using with the help of um, USGS Lake Ontario Biological Station and Nick Sard at SUNY Oswego. So that's still to come. Um, so everything that I present today is going to be the, to the creatinine level or to the, uh, could be either Cisco or Lake Whitefish, but we're gonna find out soon. So just to lay this out, this is just a map of Lake Ontario um, with the generalized regions that we know established populations are today. So the two major ones are in the Bay of Quinte in Ontario and Shimo Bay, New York. So those are kind of like our baseline, what we know is going on in the lake in terms of where spawning is occurring. And so add on top of that, all of the 1,100 ichthyoplankton samples that were taken this past year, which again is amazing and could not have been done without all of the countless field crews that went out collecting larvae. Um, so we sampled a variety of habitats all across the, you know, the North Shore, Bay of Quinte, um, the Shimo Bay region, the southern endowments like Rondekoi Bay, Sotus Bay, over by the Niagara River, and over in Hamilton Harbor as well. So for some results, um, it's kind of hard to see. Um, so the colors changed to red. If we found creatinine larvae there, I'll walk you through a little bit better for those of you that's harder to see. And then it's purple for where they're not yet processed. Again, it's hard to see, so I'll walk you through it. Um, so for the habitats that aren't yet processed, they're the Hamilton Harbor ones and then these samples over here in the St. Lawrence River. <coughs> and then for the habitats where we found larvae, um, we found a lot of samples here over in the Bay of Quinte had larvae, um, in the Shimo Bay, Fox and Grenadier, um, Henderson, um, some in Oswego, at the southern embayments, um, all of the southern, southern embayments, um, some over in the Niagara even. Um, should be a little bit easier to see on the next slide. Um, so just for example, we found larvae in many different habitats, not just the ones where we, um, our baseline knowledge was uh, in the Shimo Bay and the Bay of Quinte areas. So there's a lot more to learn about these populations. And then if we look at um, relative abundance, so this is just standardized relative abundance across the lake um, to account for variances in sampling effort. So basically the larger the circles, the more larvae that were captured. So we see that um, all across the lake, we're seeing um, some ranges in where we find no larvae versus few larvae versus many larvae. So you can see the largest circles are like in the Bay of Quinte and Chameau, which is expected knowing that those are where our established populations are. Um, and then we also found um, another kind of hot spot of larvae over here in the Brighton region on the North Shore, which is spatially separated from the other two hot spots. Um, but other things that we can see is that along with hot spots, we observe apparent cold spots. So we have hot spots where, for example, in Brighton, we capture over 75 larvae in 20 samples. But in these other habitats where production is occurring, in the same amount of effort, we only catch a few larvae. So thinking about, and then there's also Shimo Bay, which is kind of like the mother of all hotspots, where we find 1,100 larvae in uh, only 40 samples. What drives those patterns between where spawning is occurring, but where we find few larvae, and what makes a hotspot in terms of what is it about those habitats that, um, or those spawning populations that are producing so many larvae? And um, yeah, so going into that a little bit further. <clears throat> so this one is kind of moving from <coughs> patterns to processes, moving from what we observe and trying to link that to biotic and abiotic drivers. Um, so for this, I'm gonna um, just be talking about what's coming up next um, and thinking about where we're moving towards with this project and talking about some of the potential hypotheses that might explain these. So like I was saying earlier, what makes a hot spot? Is there something particularly um, exceptional about these habitats that allow for such high production of larvae? Um, is it simply an artifact of where these remnant populations are located? 
for example, in the Bay of Quinte and Shimo Bay, is this simply, uh, we, do we simply see so many larvae just because that's where the highest numbers of fish are? Or is it something to do with these habitats have the ideal set of habitat characteristics for production of these larvae? Do these habitats that are these hotspots represent the most ideal um, set of habitat characteristics for spawning and survival for early life history stages? So for example, um, as Matt was talking about earlier, perhaps the physical habitat is especially suited for development here. And then in contrast, a cold spot or a place where we see larval production occurring, there are adults spawning there, but for whatever reason, we're only seeing very few larvae in our sampling, assuming that's representative of the, the general densities of larvae there. Is it uh, simply a result of this is there's just a couple or small numbers of adults spawning there in terms of perhaps this is just natural um, strain rates in these populations. Perhaps we're only seeing low densities because there's not many adults there. They're not gonna produce many um, larvae to begin with, irregardless of the habitat there. And saying that this is the beginning of a population expansion, perhaps we'll see growth to come. Or is this a population that has higher numbers of adults, but they're facing some sort of constraint. They're spawning, but for whatever reason, we're not observing larvae because they're not, um, because they're facing some sort of biotic or abiotic limitation that's limiting survival. Um, for example, if all of the larvae um, don't survive because of starvation, um, competition, predation, or just being laid on um, inappropriate spawning habitat for development, those fishes aren't going to recruit to the population and be able to come back and complete their life cycle and sustain those populations to come. So we might be seeing some sort of bottleneck due to habitat here. And so looking at both abiotic and biotic drivers, we might be able to flesh apart some of those pieces. And so putting that all together and taking that back to the management context and the research context, if we can elucidate these factors that are driving these patterns, we might be able to better understand the role of habitat for these fishes and how that might uh, help us in terms of figuring out what the potential for these populations are for expansion and for rehabilitation. So that's kind of where we're at right now. There's still a lot more work to be done. Um, so for example, there's still more sample processing to be done. Um, including the genetics to parse that out into species. Um, and then looking quantitatively at the biotic and abiotic drivers of the um, observed differences in relative abundance and presence absence for these fishes. And then pulling that all back together, applying that and putting the puzzle pieces together for understanding early life history habitat and ecology across habitats in Lake Ontario. And I'd like to thank all of my collaborators who helped, like I said, with countless field crews to collect so many samples. Um, give a shout out to Amanda Cooper, Alyssa Lau, and Darren Reinhardt. They're not here today, but they're the amazing techs on this project, and I could not have done it without them. Um, and with that, I'll take any questions.